So, uh, thank you very much. This is joint work with uh, two co-authors, uh, Scott Baker at Stanford and Steve Davis at Chicago Booth. So, you don't really need much motivation, but policy uncertainty has recently been argued to be a key factor delaying the current recovery. So here's a picture of Olivia Blanchard at a press release on the IMF. The IMF has been uh, repeatedly claiming that, uh, I see a shortcut there, I guess, who is uh, part, of, part of this work until very recently has been uh, arguing that policy uncertainty has been delaying the recovery, has been a big factor, factor globally. Uh, in reverse, let's just say not everyone agrees. Uh, Krug, Krugman, I'm going to join Michael in saying, uh, being at the other end of the bar from uh, Paul Krugman, Paul Krugman disagrees, disagrees quite strongly. Uh, he wrote four blog pieces about this last year, two of them called The Uncertainty Scam and Cultures of Fraud. So you can imagine they weren't overtly positive about what we were going to say. Uh, now, of course, if Krugman disagrees, uh, Fox disagrees with Krugman's disagreements, so Fox agrees. Uh, so this paper is trying to kind of set that aside. It did become very political. We're also in the Romney um, manifesto. You can hear I'm English. I'm not even a citizen, so I don't get to vote, so I, I can claim to be apolitical. We tried to set that aside and really think about how much evidence is there for this. In particular, does policy uncertainty go up, which I'll show you some data to argue, I think it does. And the much harder question, which we have tentative answers, but no, not much more, how much does that matter? So I'm going to talk about measuring policy uncertainty, evaluating our measure, I'll show you it has noise, but I think it's reasonable, and then estimating the impact. So how do we measure it? Uh, well, we have an index, and uh, the index is, is kind of like, think of it as a data sausage, it has a bunch of underlying components, and I'm going to go through these one by one. This uh, news component has weight of a half. There's two forecast of disagreement measures that have a weight of a six each, and there's a tax code expiration component that has a weight of a six each. And we're going to add them together. Um, I'll start with the news component. We give it half weight because news is pretty broad. Uh, it's a pretty kind of broad coverage metric. How do we define it? Well, we take 10 major US newspapers, like the New, New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Chicago Herald Tribune, the Boston Globe, etc., and we search for articles that contain the triple of, they mention the economy uh, or econ economic, the words uncertain or uncertainty, and one of six policy words, regulation, deficit, Federal Reserve, Congress, legislation, or White House. Now, since the amount of news flow varies over time, for various reasons, including the fact that actually paper prices change, we're going to normalize that by the count of all articles in the month. Then we're going to take these 10 newspapers together, so we normalize each one of them to have a standard deviation of 1, and sum the 10 papers to get the index, which we then normalize to 100, running up to the end of 2010. And this is the graph. So this is the news-based policy uncertainty index. It's entirely based on news. What does it show? Well, it's monthly back to Jan 1985. It shows there are big spikes in news coverage uh, of articles that basically contain the words economic policy and various policy terms of uncertainty. It looks pretty sensible, so there's clearly some noise in it, but you see things like you know, Black Monday, there was a lot of policy debate after Black Monday about uh, securities regulation, wars, consequential elections, and then most obviously recently a, a surge, a surge, or really a trend upwards around the uh, recession and recovery or lack of, but most recently the fiscal cliff. So that's the news index. Um, the next two, two subcomponents we want to draw on are forecaster disagreement. Why do we do that? Well, there's a sense in which if forecasters disagree, there's some uncertainty about the future. For both of these, we're going to have one that's more contextually fiscal, which is basically state and local expenditure, and one in a sense that's more monetary inflation. So here's the fiscal measure. Uh, it's, the, it's the interquartile range of forecasts one year ahead from the Philadelphia Federal Reserve forecast survey has about 45 forecasters per uh, quarter, normalized by a backward looking average of GDP. So it's basically how far apart forecasters are on government expenditure over GDP. Again, it looks pretty sensible. Uh, a lot of disagreement in the uh, mid to late 80s when there was a budget balance act when Clinton came in. And then, uh, you know, as I think it was Gary was talking about a long period of uh, calm, and then more recently back to a period of policy uncertainty with the banking crisis and the debt ceiling dispute. Here's uh, CPI in a sense of monetary or inflation, more uncertainty. Uh, high in the second half of the 80s, we really I go back all our series to Jan 85, at least towards the end, I'll show you a longer run time series, but mostly here I'm going to show you Jan 85. This is high in the second half of the 80s, this is coming after Volcker and high inflation, so it's not that surprising. There's a lot of disagreement. It calms down a bit and then picks up recently with the banking crisis 
and QE in the, in the, the Fed statements. Then finally, the fourth component, which has a weight of one sixth on it, I guess, is uh, prominent in people's mind is uh, tax code and tax code expirations. So this is a measure that discounts the dollar value of expiring tax code from the Congressional Budget Office data. It gives a discount rate of 50% a year. Why such a high rate? Well, most people basically don't care about tax code expiring 10 years out, even five years out. You care very much about this year and next year. What you see is really the tsunami of uh, tax code that built up up, the end, up to the end of 2012 that was about to expire. So in particular, there's a small blip in 03 to 06. That's the temporary accelerated depreciation allowances in response to 9-11. And then from 08, 09 onwards, things begin to build up. A lot of the push tax cuts, a lot of the temporary tax cuts are large. They have short run horizons. And then at the end of 2012, now the uh, tax disagreement numbers drop back down. It's still pretty high by historical levels. So the CBO had no data prior to 91. Why? Well, there wasn't really an issue. So there was no uh, you know, big issue about massive amounts of expiring taxes. It's only really become a recent phenomenon. So this has dropped down to a more moderate level. So we then normalize each component to a standard deviation one, and again, at, uh, wait and add them up to get their overall index. This is what we find. This is our main index of US policy uncertainty. Uh, again, I think it looks pretty sensible. It bounces up and down around elections. It bounces up and down. Uh, around wars, external events, and most obviously recently it's risen to very high levels. So the last data we have in this graph goes up to December 2012, the fiscal cliff period. We have January and February just about to be released. They drop down to about 170. They've fallen a bit, but it's still incredibly high. So over this time period, there's short-run spikes, but a clear long-run plateau of moving up from 2008 onwards. So policy uncertainty appears to be high. One question is, what does it look like compared to other uncertainty measures? The most obvious is the VIX. Uh, the VIX is kind of the traditional, I guess, uncertainty measure, which most of you are familiar with, that it's the one month ahead implied volatility in the S&P 500 index. They're similar, but they're not the same. So the correlation over our time series is 0.55. It only goes back to 1990, where we have the VIX from. Uh, the reason it's far from one is you'll notice in particular, uh, recently, up here, the VIX is now pretty low, so the VIX I think now is below 20, whoops, it's hovering around 20. Policy uncertainty is still pretty high. So why is that? Well, I'll show you a couple of charts to kind of convince you. I think a large explanation is the VIX is one month ahead. Policy uncertainty is typically a much longer time horizon. We don't formally have a time horizon, but to help explain some of the gap, here's now three charts. So here's the policy uncertainty again at the top in blue. Here's the VIX in red, one month ahead. And here, using data from Goldman Sachs that they kindly provided us, is 10 year ahead in applied volatility, basically doing the same calculations you do for the VIX. And you notice that stayed pretty high. So the vol uh, curve is sloped upwards. This is correlated with the policy uncertainty measure to a much higher level, about 0.8. So part of the explanation is policy uncertainty is high, it looks like this is more of a longer run phenomena and certainty over a shorter run phenomena. To me, it feels intuitively reasonable. There's clearly a budget gap that needs to be solved when the decisions are going to be made. As we know, they're not likely to be made by Friday. Uh, I, you know, I don't quite know when they are going to be made, uh, but it doesn't look like any time soon. Here's the data for Europe. So we have for a number of countries. Here's an aggregate European index. Europe looks pretty similar recently. It surged up. It went up a bit later, so the Europe went into a recession a bit later than the US, and the uncertainty measures have gone up a bit later, but they're now higher. Europe, if anything, is kind of behind and in worse shape. This is most of it driven by the European crisis. Uh, Europe has its own cycle before then. If you go back, there's the Nice Treaty, the Accession Treaty, etc. We don't see spikes like those in the US. We've also got data for China, India, Canada, building it for Japan. Interestingly, every country we've looked at on policy uncertainty seems to have a, re a recent surge. In part, it's contagion from the US, and in part, coincidentally, it may be because of the recession, the governments have become more unstable uh, across countries. So then the question is, what's driving US policy uncertainty? Well, this seems to be mainly about fiscal policy and healthcare policy. And why don't I go through this table to explain exactly how we come to that conclusion? So, this is a table that is a count, a normalized count of articles about economic policy uncertainty. This is shown on the top line. We've normalized it 
So uh, the average, where is it? Back up here, across the entire period, economic policy uncertainty is 100. And then we've got material, meaningful sub-periods, kind of the first half of the recession, and then the kind of very poor recovery. Uh, you can see economic policy uncertainty overall is about 30% higher than its long average, and almost double what it was leading into the recession. Then we want to ask, well, look, what's driving this? We have this large number of articles on economic policy uncertainty. We can also cross-search them that they mention not just any policy words, but a subset, for example, on monetary policy. So they mention that uh, Federal Reserve Board, interest rates, inflation, uh, quantitative easing, etc. And this is what we do on the road below. So what does that show? Well, monetary policy uncertainty, about one third of all articles about policy uncertainty mention something about monetary policy. So it's clearly a big issue. But maybe somewhat surprisingly, it's not high in the most recent four years. So you know, this seems maybe strange to economists when you think about quantitative easing, uh, you know, unconventional monetary policy, everything that's going on in Washington. I think the story is, as far as newspapers are concerned, monetary policy just isn't that uncertain because interest rates are low and inflation is low. And so there just aren't a large number of articles. There, I mean, there are large, there are a third of them, but there are no more than previously, and certainly there are other spikes. So monetary policy potentially is uncertain. It's just not being reported as such in the news. What's driving the stories in the news is basically taxes. They've more than doubled, uh, approximately doubled, uh, spending, and then various regulation, particularly health care uh, and some of the other entitlement programs. So the story is very much out on the news-based index. There's a lot of uncertainty about taxes. There's a lot of uncertainty about spending, and there's a lot of uncertainty about regulation, particularly healthcare. I'll come back to say some anecdotes uh, about that. Finally, what about Europe? Uh, well, you know, uh, as a European, I guess I'm used to it, but now Americans don't seem to care that much about Europe. You know, American news is, is focused on America. Uh, you see it with policy uncertainty. So here's the bit, the bit <coughs> of the core part of Europe, sovereign debt. That's gone up. In fact, that's gone up tenfold versus what it was previously. But the share of news that's uh, you know, European-focused is so small that it doesn't really affect our overall index. So yes, lots of uncertainty in Europe, but since Americans don't seem to care that much about it, it doesn't seem to be driving our index that much. So what about evaluating the index? How reasonable is this? Uh, well, there are two concerns you might have. One is suitability. So is this a suitable way to, you know, particularly news, is it a reasonable way to uh, measure policy uncertainty and accuracy? So, you know, in our 10 papers enough, is monthly enough, etc. And I go through both of these in detail. So, firstly, suitability. One thing we can do is say, well, look, we can't measure political uncertainty except for our news index, but we can generate news indexes of other things. We can measure in alternative data sets and see how good they are. So one is financial uncertainty. So we have the VIX measure as a kind of reasonable measure of financial uncertainty. And we use a news index to look for mentions of economy, <coughs> uncertainty, and financial words. So stock prices, equity prices, and stock market. And that matches up pretty well with the VIX. So it's not that news is problematic or that we can't match the VIX. If we go after a news search that's going to look like the VIX, it does pretty well. So the correlation here is about 0.75. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's, I'd say it's, it's pretty good. Something else we can look at is unemployment. So one thing to point out, this data series now we push back to 1949, which is when we have unemployment data. And we can search on unemployment in the news, just how often we mention about unemployment layoffs or job losses, against on the right the unemployment rate. And again, it looks pretty good. The correlation is 0.72 is a pretty good fit. So if we use new searches for other prominent economic uh, factors like uh, financial volatility or unemployment, it seems to work reasonably well. So it's not perfect, but I think it's reasonable. The other thing is accuracy. How accurate or reliable is a new search? Uh, so to do, to do this, we had six undergraduates read 3,500 uh, newspapers, uh, I guess a task. Well, some of them enjoyed, some of them didn't, but what we wanted to get them to do is to uh, cope the we actually, so this is wave one, we're having a second wave now, but it turns out to be very useful to try and compare computer searches versus human reads. So the question is, uh, we have a computer searching, you can imagine all kinds of problems. What happens if a human reads it, how do they compare? To do that, what we had to do, we did various pilot rounds, etc., but uh, set up an audit guide, it's a 29 page audit guide, it goes through very clearly what we mean by policy uncertainty, it has a series of frequently asked questions on tricky cases and some examples. And you can see there are examples of what's called 
true positive, that's correct, or false positive, when our computer search picks it up and it turns out the human reason says it's wrong, and the false negative where our computer search misses it, say it uses the word ambiguous rather than uncertain, but the human thinks it's correct. What do we find? Well, uh, we, before I tell you what we find, one of the things we use this for that's very helpful is to refine the search. So this is a graph of all the different search possibilities and various words you could use based on false negatives, on less false negatives, or on less false positives. So here is the minimization error. Our search, our final criteria of six words is about there. So we picked a kind of optimal search term. It's also the case that our correlation on what we define as an EPU equals one article, an economic policy uncertainty article, is correlated 0.65 with the human. So uh, over time, our index looks pretty similar to our undergraduates pulled out. Again, there's noise, but it looks pretty similar. So, you know, it's reasonably good. I guess ultimately, we had enough undergraduates. It's like monkeys with Shakespeare. <laughs> Eventually, we get there. We just have to read everything. But at this stage, uh, until I guess until my research budget expands enough, I will be on computers and undergraduate check. Finally, another issue that uh, the comments of the last session, and I guess uh, my experience, you know, Michael most obviously mentioned this, has become quite politicized. And so, something you worry about is uh, is it driven by political slant to the newspapers? The answer is statistically yes, but quantitatively no. So you can break the 10 newspapers down by Gensko and Shapiro's media slant in, uh, index into the five most left and the five most right slanted into uh, media outlets. You can look at them under Republican versus Democrat presidents or Congresses, all kinds of stuff. There is some statistical difference between them, but it's very small. You just, if you have enough data and enough variation, you'll pick something up. So there is a little bit of bias. The Wall Street Journal appears to be talking more about policy uncertainty recently than other newspapers, but it's second order. So finally, what about the impact of policy uncertainty on the recovery? This is, to be honest, the hardest question. The shop asked me this over lunch. Uh, I'm not, you know, I, I have a guess. I don't have a particularly strong answer. The, you know, why might it matter? Why might it matter is pretty obvious. The literature has multiple channels. Uh, you know, here's a quote from Dave Co Coate, who's the chairman and CEO of Honeywell, a Fortune 500 company employing 130,000 people worldwide, who made the comment, you know, which is the whole, your whole intuition. Right now, we're holding back on all but the most necessary external hiring and on capital expenditures. If I can make the decision now or six months from now, I'll make the decision six months from now and see what develops. So that was at the end of last year. The other example I hear a lot is small businesses. I was driving in California and I heard a woman interviewed on the radio that owned two Baskin and Robbins ice cream franchises with 20 people in each, so she had 40 people. And she said she was very concerned, this was about a year ago, very concerned about the Affordable Care Act. Her argument was if I open up a third franchise, the ACA comes in with 60 employees, I have to pay health care insurance, I don't want to do that. Uh, so if it's definitely coming in, I'm going to instead open up a restaurant a kind of fast food restaurant, it's a separate business, it's a pain to manage it, but then I, both of them are 20 and 40, they're under the cap. If it definitely isn't coming in, I'll expand now. She said a year ago, I don't know what's going to happen because the Democrats and the Republicans are fighting, so I'm basically not expanding. And this is the alternative small business angle and what you hear a lot about. Probably less now because healthcare is more clear now, but certainly a year ago. There was, and there's still, I think, some residual uncertainty over regulation, healthcare, etc. So the evidence, well, the survey evidence, which in some ways is Pretty good, actually, compared to, you know, the econometric evidence is a lot better, I guess. So the survey evidence um, is suggested matters. It's hard to distinguish policy from other uncertainty, but, for example, the Chamber of Commerce said more than half of small businesses reported economic uncertainty as their top concern. Uh, the Global CEO survey does, what, six regions. They all mentioned uncertainty or volatile economic growth as their top concern. Um, the National Association of Business Economists made exactly the same comment. Here they talk about uncertainty about fiscal policy. They're more explicit about policy. Um, closer to home, I guess, we here is the FOMC Beige Book. So the Beige Book is a, uh, is a summary, about a 15,000 word summary that's released two weeks before each FOMC meeting that surveys conditions around the US based on local context and regional Fed's views on the economy. And what we do with the Beige Book, and they go back and they come out uh, typically you know, eight or ten times a year, is we just do two things. One is the manual search of how frequently the word uncertainty arises. And secondly, uh, we had another underground read through them, and every time the word uncertainty arises, find out if it is or is not in the context of policy. There are some borderline cases, but you can have a rough idea of what's going on. 
What you can see here is this looks a lot like our index. The base rate didn't mention uncertainty that much for long periods of time. There's a bit of a spike uh, after 9 11, there's a bit of a spike here. I'm not entirely sure what this is actually, but if you run forwards, uh, as the financial crisis starts to happen, and most recently at the end of 2012, beginning of 13, there was a huge surge of discussion. And if you read the most recent Beige book, it's full. And you can see here it goes up to 45 or something, full of discussion about policy uncertainty, regional context complaining about fiscal and healthcare uncertainty, etc. So that's, you know, suggests that this is an issue. Businesses are certainly raising it regularly across the country. What about doing something slightly more sophisticated? Uh, well, we can put it into a vector auto regression. So what we can do is take our policy uncertainty measure, take a control for the S&P 500, so a stock market level measure, interest rates, employment, output, etc., and run vector auto regressions. Uh, what do we find? Well, I should be very clear to about causality. So you know nothing about causality. What we can tell about is, in a sense, predictability. So when policy uncertainty goes up, it forecasts that in future industrial production will fall by about four percent and recover. There's a pretty big drop, GDP is about 2.5%. It forecasts employment will drop by about 2.5 uh, mi million and recover upwards. So it suggests they're reasonable magnitudes, they're not enormous, they certainly could, this, you know, this kind of thing couldn't explain the entire uh, recession or lack of recovery. There are two obvious problems with VAR, with well, this VAR. Uh, the obvious problem for anyone that's run the nose is reverse causality. So policies forward look. So I'm a policymaker. I see the recession. I start acting. You know, uh, Pietro has a, pa a paper exactly, Lugos Pastor, exactly on this. So there's a reverse causality problem that's horrendously hard to deal with. There's also a robustness problem. You can fiddle around with the data and change the ordering, etc. Turns out on the second thing, it's easier to deal with this. This stuff's pretty robust. So you can change the order and change what you put in, what you take out, add in the VIX, take out the VIX, do all kinds of stuff. Uh, because it's monthly data, because the trends are pretty clear, when policy uncertainty goes up, however you cut the data, output tends to drop. So it's robust to uh, that. Whether it's causal, it's a much tougher test. Um, our view, you know, to conclude, frankly aligns with something Goldman Sachs put out at the end of last year. So the Goldman Sachs guys have been using our data to uh, do some analysis on policy uncertainty and claimed, which I think is pretty reasonable, from 08 to 010, as much of it was probably effect rather than cause. So, you know, the economy tax, the, we've been through the last section financial crisis, there's a, you know, Lehman's is the match, policymakers respond, that generates a lot of uncertainty. In a sense, it's an amplification mechanism to make uh, the recession worse. I think from 2000 onwards, 2011 onwards, it's easier to argue it's more causal. A lot of the policy uncertainty now is political bickering, the fiscal cliff, the debt ceiling debate. It's related to the recession. I think it's easier to argue it's a more causal problem holding back growth, and that's our sense, and this is the, kind of the uh, view of Goldman's. It's also true that policy uncertainty seems to be driving a lot of asset market volatility. So another piece Goldman's put out from a different team uh, that I, you know, I know many people have been looking at this, have been using our data in various hedge funds and investment banks, Policy uncertainty appears to link very strongly with uh, risk spreads, asset market volatility, right now apparently better than the big stuff. Um, so the final thing is, recently we've been extending the news back, I guess, you know, the last session was looking back, the sessions are integrating, I'm trying to integrate backwards to the history. Uh, we've been extending the news back to 1900, and you see a couple of things. So one is, uh, you see the huge spike, obviously, around the Great Depression, particularly policy uncertainty spikes not at the beginning of the Great Recession, but around the time that FDA, Roosevelt comes in and starts up the New Deal. So it's incredibly active, 100 days. You see it spiking before World War I, the entry, <coughs> the panic, the creation of the Fed. Then there's this long period of calm. And then recently, it's risen, but it's also clear that this is a secular trend up. Uh, it's surprising, we spent a lot of time thinking, well, look, our newspaper's the same. The answer is hard to be certain, but we have five papers in this that are published and we have online all the way back to 1900. So this is the Washington Post, Boston Globe, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, Chicago Herald Tribune. We can get online all the way back. They change, they move, we're investigating it, but I don't think, but that's one explanation. The other explanation of what's going on is on this graph is that basically government has just become a much bigger fraction of the economy. So government expenditure as a share of GDP since we have the nipper tables going back to after World War II has gone up from 25% to 45%. It's more or less doubled. Not surprisingly, if government's more important, 
government uncertainty and hence policy uncertainty becomes a lot more important. So it looks like there is, in addition to the recent crisis fueled spike in policy uncertainty, a more long-run secular trend as government grows and becomes larger, policy becomes more important and uncertainty goes up. So um, to conclude, you know, what, what we find, I think policy uncertainty appears to be high recently as in the last four years. It's high in relation to the last 20 years. And it also looks like to have been secularly <coughs> rising maybe over the last 100 years. Uh, does it matter? It's much harder for us to say. My gut feeling is yes, it's a factor. If I had to put a number on, you know, literally pulling numbers out of thin air, my sense of good view is maybe a third or half. It's definitely not, you know, driving most of the slow recovery. It's a contributory factor. Um, the other thing I say for people that are interested, we put the monthly and in fact daily data online. Um, we have the US, Canada, for the European countries, India, China, Japan. We also put that equity financial uh, data online. We have a daily series that's updated. It's also available on Hava Analytics and it's about to go on Bloomberg if, if that's easier to get hold of it. Okay? Thank you.